everyone. I'm going to call this meeting to order and um, I want to welcome everybody to this event to provide important information about the three county commission redistricting maps proposed, proposed by the Hillsborough County Board of Commissioners. The League of Women Voters of Hillsborough County is proud to provide this opportunity for thoughtful, objective, unbiased consideration of this most important activity in our democracy. I am Deborah Kaufman and I am president of the Hillsborough League. Before we meet our distinguished speakers and dive into this very important topic, I would like to provide a little information about the League to those of you who are not familiar. The League of Women Voters was founded over a hundred years ago, shortly after passage of the constitutional amendment granting women in the United States the right to vote. It was then and continues to be a nonpartisan political organization committed to educating voters and advocating for important community issues. These two separate but equally important functions help us to achieve our mission of empowering voters and defending democracy. Membership is open to all persons 16 and older and becoming a member locally automatically makes you a member of our state and national leagues. If you are interested in joining us, please indicate that in the chat tonight and we will contact you with membership information. And now for a bit about tonight's topic and our guests. As I publicly commented to the county's legislative delegation last month, we as champions of democracy know that empowered voters are essential to our community's success in providing justice, equity, and a quality of life for everyone. In a representative democracy such as ours, it is vital that the way voters are apportioned into geographically defined voting districts can serve to allow voters a true one person, one vote power, and should certainly never do all it can to make it impossible for that power to exist. So tonight we welcome an expert in geographically based statistical analysis, and by the way, a local league member, who will provide us with objective measurements of how close each of these proposed district maps meet the generally accepted parameters for fair districting, allowing you to decide which of these maps you will let our commissioners know is your choice. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce, introduce a member of our board of directors and the leader in our efforts to ensure fair districting, Noreen Dollard, who will provide the meeting ground rules and speak first on, among other things, the nature of fair districting principles and Hillsborough County's timelines for drawing and approving new maps. Noreen. Thanks, Deb, and welcome everyone. Um, we're so super excited to uh, welcome you all uh, to this webinar tonight. Um, things are really hopping all across the state and across the nation. Um, with respect to uh, redistricting, Florida is somewhat slower than some of the others um, who have already completed their process, but um, you know, fairly uniformly, we are all a little behind the time because of the late release of census data um, that was about six months late. Um, in any case, so we'll get to that. Uh, but tonight I just wanted to, let's start with some ground rules. Let's start with my slides advancing. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so we're gonna talk about redistricting, what it means for our communities, um, and very importantly, making sure our voices are heard. Uh, our focus tonight is gonna be more on the local redistricting because the timelines are, state, are shorter um, for the, the local commissions and school boards. Um, the state uh, legislature has a, a longer uh, time frame since session doesn't start until January. Um, just so you are aware, um, we are recording this event uh, so that we can share it uh, with those who could not be present. Um, so if that is uncomfortable for you, you can um, dismiss yourself and you can always um, 
we will send the, uh, the link to our YouTube uh, recording of this so you can watch it at your leisure um, another time. Why is this? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the ground rules are you guys should be muted, but if not, please check and make sure you are muted and check periodically. Um, we don't wanna you know, squash any uh, participation. We just wanna keep the background noise to a dull roar. Um, so we are gonna take questions by way of the chat function. So you should see a little chat and a bubble. And if you click on that, you can type questions into the chat. Um, the presenters, uh, John and I will uh, periodically stop and um, the fabulous Lynn Price is going to uh, help monitor the chat and will let us alert us to any questions. Um, if you would avoid private chats, if you're familiar with that, how that works to the presenters while we're presenting, um, that would be great. Um, just so that we can maintain our, our focus. But by all means, participate because that's why we're here. We're just uh, very eager to share this information with people so they can make good decisions about the maps and get ready to participate um, in, in all of the redistricting processes, local and state. So redistricting 101. <clears throat> so redistricting, redistricting is the process of drawing electoral district boundaries. And we are required to do so every 10 years um, after the decennial census. So uh, census, as I said earlier, uh, activities were delayed um, just about the time that people were um, filling out their census in April 2020 is when the world went sideways and COVID hit. So some of the follow-up procedures um, were delayed in, you know, outreach and trying to maximize census participation um, was, it just went on longer um, because we all needed to use alternate strategies to reach out um, and make sure all residents uh, were counted. So, like I said, we were a little behind the timelines but on the normal, the normal timelines. Um, some terms to remember. Um, gerrymandering is when improper, <laughs> districts are improperly drawn and to favor an incumbent or a particular uh, party. Um, and to minimize the impact of uh, party or uh, cultural or linguistic minorities and their ability to voice their, uh, their, to make their voices heard in the electoral process. And, you know, to go back to what Deb said, um, making sure, you know, one person, one vote um, is, is the rule of the land. And there's two predominant ways that this can occur. One is cracking. And what this refers to is diluting the power of an opposing party or, an oppo or um, a cultural minority's um, ability to make its voice heard. So there are not enough uh, folks to form communities of interest, which John is gonna talk a lot about, um, that will, you know, that can, that have a particular viewpoint that should be, you know, allowed to express itself. Um, in the electoral process. Um, packing is when all, uh, an opposing party or a cultural <clears throat> group is, they're put into districts rather artificially, um, but so they are all packed into, um, into a single district. So they are, their voice is not heard across districts. It's limited to a, one particular district. So these are the most common ways uh, gerrymandering takes place. Are there questions so far, Lynn? No, I'm sorry, no questions yet. Okay, thanks. Um, so Florida was something of a poster child for what not to do um, in redistricting in uh, subsequent to the 2010 
uh, census and uh, redistricting. And um, you're probably read the papers about you know things that happened that were not did not result in an open and transparent redistricting process. <clears throat> and so um, in, in 2010, uh, the League and uh, the Fair Districts Coalition, which still exists, um, sponsored constitutional amendments uh, to the Florida Constitution focusing uh, on ensuring fair districting and minimizing gerrymandering. <clears throat> Floridian, Floridians passed these amendments. <clears throat> The legislature and the Republican Party um, disregarded these. Uh, and so the League of Women Voters of Florida and Common Cause sued um, and won, which is great. We like this, but the legal process is, is, a, is a slow one. And it took five years for the districts to be, uh, for that case to be resolved and for districts to be uh, properly drawn, which meant for five years, there were voices in our state that were not adequately, did not have adequate representation, were not able to uh, voice their, um, their, their will. So um, we don't want to do that again. So what we do want is um, we want a fair and transparent process um, and that it follows fair districting principles, which I hope is the next slide. Um, yes, good. Um, so the fair district amendments, <clears throat> basically they say that the lines cannot unfairly benefit one party <clears throat> or incumbent. Um, the lines, cannot harm racial or language minorities um, ability to participate in the political process in elect representatives of their choice. Um, they must be contiguous, meaning one line must go all the way around. Um, there can't be like two dots and then there's another district in between. Um, and John will show you this in a much more literal fashion um, in a bit. <clears throat> And unless there are other compelling reasons, districts must be as compact as possible and follow the geographical elements. They must be equal in population and they have to try to respect uh, county and municipal lines. And we'll see a lot more about that. So these are the, these are the principles that we need to keep in mind at, in this process of evaluating what is a fair map? So the Voting Rights Act um, has, has been, some, some aspects of it have been uh, gutted by uh, some of the protections of gerrymandering. <clears throat> so for example, we don't, uh, Florida being one and Hillsborough County um, being one, uh, we no longer need preclearance um, pre um, for the Justice Department um, with respect to redistricting. Um, states can change voting laws without review of the Department of Justice. <clears throat> um, another case, in another case, uh, it was determined that federal courts will not review gerrymandering cases. Um, which they consider to be outside of their jurisdiction. So some of the protections um, have been whittled away to some extent. So it's even more important that we make our decision makers, we hold them to the standard of transparency and uh, making sure that they do everything in the open. So what can we do? So we can do what we're doing right now. We can talk about um, how to draw maps or how to evaluate maps with citizens. Um, should there be, should it come to that? And I think it will. Um, I don't know in what arena, whether state or local, but um, litigation is, is a possibility because sometimes that's the only way to hold our decision makers accountable for um, doing the right thing. And um, 
for us, we need to let our legislators or commissioners or school board members or the, the city councils know that we're watching and we expect a fair and transparent process and we will demand a fair and transparent process. Um, so you can join us and Deb said you can put the information in the chat at the end of this talk. There are some QR codes and you can scan those and um, lickety split join us. Um, <clears throat> you can, uh, the Florida Fair District Coalition, like I said, they meet very often these days. <clears throat> um, and it includes Common Cause, uh, Progress Florida, um, the League, and a lot of other um, interested, the ACLU, Southern Poverty Law Center, a bunch of groups that are, are very uh, invested in ensuring that this be a fair and transparent process. Um, exploring independent commissions that draw maps, um, that's not an immediate solution for what we're talking about tonight, but that is a possible, that is one model of ensuring that districts are district drawing is taken out of the hands of the people most affected by them, our representatives and commissioners <clears throat> and school boards that we elect. So other states, some have these commissions. So like I said, that's not an immediate fix for our situation, but it is a proactive way perhaps of um, ensuring that fair maps are drawn in the future. Are there questions, Lynn? Clear so far. Very good. So what's the current state of things? <clears throat> um, the Florida legislature, um, the committees have already been meeting. Um, the Senate has a single committee, the legislate, the House has um, one committee that's uh, has two subcommittees. And what the state has to do, one, is we have a new congressional seat because our population has grown since 2010. Um, so one job is to figure out where the congressional lines in our state will be drawn. The other uh, job is to uh, determine what the state, the state house um, and Senate, where those lines are drawn. So. <clears throat> Um, that's the work of these committees. And so they've been, they've met the first two committee meeting, the committee weeks, um, I believe the next meeting, committee weeks start again, November 2nd. <clears throat> I think that's Monday. Anyways, so they'll be meeting again. Um, so far their activities have been educational. So educating the committees, um, the staff are educating the uh, senators and representatives on on the maps, on the software, uh, mapping software that they're using and hosting um, and that sort of thing. So they haven't moved into um, actually evaluating um, the maps at this time, but it won't be long. So this basically just says, you know, this, this is an opportunity it could be an opportunity for, you know, the, the powers that be to make a grab for power um, because drawing the lines is, is very important to, uh, you know, could be very important and has been known to be very important to the success, success of a given party. So um, the fact that we've gained a federal congressional seat um, is, is, it's a big deal. And so find, figuring out where that, that seat will be. The other thing is in the last 10 years, our demographics have changed uh, substantially um, in terms of our uh, racial and ethnic um, diversity. Um, so we need to make sure that we are, um, you know, being fair and being, uh, that all, all Florida's uh, diversity is represented um, in the electoral process. So 
I would encourage you all to get involved. Um, the school district um, has a meeting this week and when we get to the end of the presentation, I'll give you the details on that. And the same with the timelines um, and meeting dates for Hillsborough County and Pasco um, County Commission. Um, so at, to some degree, we have a greater, we have greater leverage um, with our local, um, local leaders. We have relationships with our commissioners and city council and um, sometimes more so than the state. So this is a great opportunity to, um, to really make sure um, they know we're watching and that we, they know that we are um, taking an active role. So um, like the state, Hillsborough County must redistrict um, every 10 years um, for the four, the four, uh, four of the seven districts. Um, three of them are at large, so we don't need to worry about those. Um, and we must uh, by charter be done um, December 31st of this year. There are three maps that have been proposed so far. Um, well, not proposed, more have been proposed, <clears throat> but there are currently uh, three maps that are being proposed and on the Hillsborough County website. And uh, Cindy has put the website um, information in the chat so you can uh, help yourself um, and look, see the maps for yourselves um, and what the timelines are. And if you care to make comments directly through the website or if you want to request time at the commission meeting, um, all the information is there. So, um, Lynn, are there is there anything other questions? We do have one question, Noreen. I'm not sure we can answer it though. The question is, where are the likely locations for the additional house seat for the congressional seats? Uh, yeah. No I, house uh, additional. Yeah. And, and yes, I, in Congress, in Congress, yes. Yes, that was um, my question, yes. I uh, I mean, I know as much as the next person, so other people can uh, weigh their opinions. I've heard Central Florida, <clears throat> um, but this area is not out of the running because um, we are the fourth fastest growing section um, of the state. So. Um, there is a possibility they'll try to um, put it in our neck of the woods, um, which would be great. Um, but that's the information I have. So I would defer to others if uh, they want to speculate. Um, but those are the rumors I'm aware of. Someone made the comment that Vern Buchanan has too many people in his district. So I guess that's maybe yeah, a possibility. That's why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, sorry, and I would in include that in our general cloud here. Yeah. Our area. So um, were there others? Well, Deb asked something about Gwen Myers, but I'm not sure what the question is. She says, I believe that's Gwen Myers, right? I th because I think the, the name is on the slide is it's I think it's M-Y-E-R-S. Just want to make sure everybody knows oh, who oh, it is. Oh, oh, oh. oh that's funny because that's what it was, and then I I changed it. Oh, okay. So my apologies to wrong, Commissioner then. Myers. I, it so is I, just so we know who it is. <laughs> yes, my apologies if that's spelled wrong. Um, I think I actually just went back and changed it just before this call. Anyways, um, if there are no other questions, that's definitely Commissioner Glenn Myers. Um, I am very happy to introduce John Godwin. Um, John has uh, a lot of mapping experience and he's uh, given a lot of his time to making sense of the, the maps. And uh, so we're very, very, very glad um, to have him here tonight and to walk us through uh, ways of understanding the maps and evaluating them with respect um, to the fair district, fair districting principles. So I'm going to turn it over to John. Uh, I'm going to mute myself and uh, um, take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much to the local league for having me. Uh, 
my wife and I are proud members of the league and are, are thrilled to talk a little bit about empowering voters in defending democracy, the league mission. Uh, let me go ahead and I'm going to start sharing my screen so that you all can see uh, a slide deck that I got together in preparation for, for this conversation. All right, do you all see the slide deck now? If somebody can give me a thumbs up. All right, perfect. Um, so diving into this, as was mentioned, we have three maps under consideration right now. Um, they mentioned the three commissioners who, who sponsored those maps. I'm gonna go ahead and just refer to the maps, how they're labeled, maps E, F, and G. I feel like zooming out a little bit and not labeling it specifically with personalities is helpful to make sure that we're doing uh, an unbiased and really data-driven analysis. Uh, so leaping into it, there are six general pillars to redistricting, to making sure that districts are as fair as possible. Noreen talked a little bit about gerrymandering. It is possible to hit each one of these pillars and excel at each one of these pillars and still have some gerrymandering going on, but these pillars are really aimed at limiting gerrymandering to the greatest extent possible and making sure those districts are as fair as possible. So those pillars and what I'll, I'll walk through are that the districts should each have an equal population with one another. They should be compact. They should keep together communities of commonality. I'll explain that term. They should have boundaries that follow city, county, and geographic lines. That is a best practice, but it's also part of Florida state law because of the League of Women Voters advocacy. That law doesn't apply to county commission districts, but it's something that you really want to see all redistricting processes adhere to. Um, in redistricting, the district should preserve minority access districts, something that I'll also explain and go a little bit more in depth with, and they should all be contiguous. So jumping straight into uh, equal population. So each district should have the exact same population as all the other districts in an ideal world. So in our case, we have four districts. Think about taking the overall population of Hillsborough County, dividing it by four. That's what you should have. Now, this is basically getting at the basis of democracy, one person, one vote. We should all have an equal seat at the table, equal influence on the system. This doesn't quite actually see its way through because you also want to take a lot of other things into consideration. You want to follow some of those natural boundaries. You want to keep together communities. So there is going to be some variation. But what the Supreme Court has said is that for municipal elections, local elections, county elections, that the variation between the population of the largest district and the smallest district shouldn't be more than 10% of the overall ideal size of a district. Um, that's kind of a complicated way of wording it, but that's population variance. And the thing to remember is it's a maximum of 10% um, to be legal. Looking at the three maps that we have, maps E, F, and G, we see that map E has a 7.7% population variance, map F is 9.3, and map G is 7.3. Your objective is zero, your maximum is 10% on this one. Um, what you'll also see is that over this decade, all of those population variances are likely to expand. Uh, that doesn't make the map illegal as soon as they pass 10%. Any one of these maps that were passed will likely pass 10%. Um, but just something to keep in mind that this will only expand, will only exacerbate with time as populations move throughout the county and development happens in certain areas more, uh, more quickly than others. John, before we move on to the next slide, we have a question um, from David. He wants to know if South County District 4 needs to be smaller, why did Pat Kemp and the staff map take away East Tampa from University area to MLK Boulevard from District 2? Yeah. And I'm going to need to process that question in a second. So let me uh, glance at it. East Tampa. Okay, um, 
And I think that the, the question here, well, first, just one point of clarification, there is no more staff map under consideration. All the staff maps have been thrown out. So the only maps under consideration now are, are uh, commissioner uh, submitted maps. Um, now with population variance, what you'll see is each one of the commissioners uh, chose to include and exclude different areas um, to, to hit that population variance. I think that what this question is really getting at is, is the USF area. Um, that uh, what you'll see is that on map E, USF is in district two, the, which is our northernmost district. It's the district currently held by Ken Hagen. Under maps E and G, USF area is in district three, which is Gwen Meyer seat. Um, so there's a real debate to go on there. Um, I think most of the debate that I've seen about this isn't actually in regards to population variance. What it really is getting at is, um, do you want something of prestige in, in District 3? That's the major argument that I've heard for putting USF in District 3, that it's an economic hub, it's an economic engine, and we want that in District 3. Um, the counter argument that I've heard is that USF area has a popula uh, population that is only 8% African American. So if you were to put an uh, area in District 3 that only has an 8% population that is African-American, you're really decreasing the African-American numbers and you're putting in uh, a large amount of white voters. And then kind of the other hindrance, and I'll explain this a little bit more, uh, but the other hindrance is you would be putting in white Democrats, which would shift the Democratic primary. And the Democratic primary is often what influences uh, minority access districts. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. I don't wanna just drop partisan mentions without going into that. Um, so I promise I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, to jump to the next area of compactness. So compactness aims to have each district as close to a geometric, geometric shape as possible. Ge they should ideally look like triangles, rectangles, circles. Um, they shouldn't be elongated or have meandering lines. Um, it should look geometric. The reason for this is kind of twofold. One, the less meandering and less elongation that you can do, the less gerrymandering um, is possible uh, because you're not gonna be able to carve in certain populations and carve out other ones. The other, part of this is it pairs together neighboring communities. You're gonna be more likely to be in the district with your neighbors if it's just a cohesive shape rather than elongated or meandering. There's actually some official processes established by some academics on how to measure how compact a district is. Um, I list the three of them here. It's the convex hall method, the REOC method, and the Polesby popper method. Um, the convex hall and Polesby popper measure meandering lines. So this first image, the image on the left, shows a little bit of meandering. What you see is a district cr uh, crawls into an, an area and then crawls back out and then crawls in again. The convex hall and the Polsby popper methods would penalize the map for doing that. Um, and then elongation, uh, is basically where you don't have equal width and length, and that's a way of kind of cutting straight through communities. So going through the grades on this, I'm not going to read off all of these numbers. Y'all can kind of see, uh, and just for, um, I didn't clarify this at the beginning, but the, the green highlighted cells are kind of the best in category, um, and the red highlighted cells are the ones that fit, fell furthest from the objective. So the objective with each one of these measures is to hit 100%. If it was a perfect circle, a perfect square or triangle, it would be 100%. Um, I will go ahead and jump to the next slide. Uh, communities of commonality. So this is really one of the most important parts of setting up an effective legislative body. The idea is each member of the legislative body, whether it's commissioners, board members, whatever, should have a pretty cohesive constituency that they can represent. They wanna be able to be a voice for a, 
um, for a group of people who have similar shared interests. What you really want to avoid is putting a commissioner in a situation where they're voting in favor of the interest of half of their constituents and against the interest of the other half. That really then means that you're silencing or not representing part of your constituency. So there's two ways that you can try and make sure that you have cohesive communities within one district. One is by avoiding dividing communities that are in place. And the other is by uniting communities that have shared, um, shared traits, shared interests. So with dividing communities, we have 33 communities, census designated communities in Hillsborough County. These aren't necessarily cities, though the cities are included. These are other places like Keystone, Lutz, Bel Rico, Balm, Progress Village, Waimama. Um, it is really, really hard to draw these districts without dividing the communities. But as the League of Women Voters set out for a state level standard, it is one of the objectives that you should have. What you see is that um, each one of the maps tends to divide about half of the communities. Um, so that just kind of highlights how difficult it is. Beyond avoiding dividing the community, you really, really want to divide, uh, avoid dividing the community multiple times. So it's one thing to divide a community in two, but if you divide a community in three, that's where you're really cracking the community, as Noreen mentioned before, where you're diluting it across multiple districts and their voice isn't really gonna be heard. Um, so what I did was just uh, did a count of total number of community divisions for each map. Um, so what you see is map E has 15 and maps F and G both have 19 divisions. Um, then uniting communities. This is where it gets kind of anecdotal and less objective, but one objective, uh, because what you're talking about is, oh, you know, Keystone really feels a lot like loops. So let's put these two together. Or um, the Noto Sasa has a lot more in common with Plant City. So let's try and put those two together. There's not really an objective justification for that. So what I went ahead and did is overlaid these three maps with the urban service area. And what the urban service area is, is it's how the county determines land use and zoning, um, where you have a zone of the county that's uh, flagged as this is urban and then the rest of it is flagged as rural. One of these communities that you wanna keep united is our rural agrarian communities. This is actually something that Stacy White spoke about extensively in one of the first meetings on redistricting. So I measured the number of square miles in each district um, where there are urban, where there is a rural area in a suburban or urban district. So this measures uh, those three. All maps come pretty close to one another, but you can see a little bit of that discrepancy. Then getting at the heart of uh, one of the things that I love that the league uh, advocated for, um, boundaries should follow city and geographic lines. Um, so this, the nice thing about this is it, it accomplishes two things. It makes the boundaries less confusing for voters. And this is really crucial. What you don't want is for one voter to have different names on their ballot, different races on their ballot than their neighbor. Um, that really causes confusion and it causes a disconnect with their local legislative bodies. So if you follow major uh, city lines or rivers, roads, river uh, canals, railroad tracks, those sorts of things, it's a much more logical thing for, for residents to understand so that they're able to actually understand what is their district, where does it go, who else is, is a member of their district. The other nice thing about this is it really ties the hands of map makers. It limits their ability to gerrymander the seats. So what I did was I went ahead and measured for all three maps, the length of their boundary lines that did not follow city lines, major roadways, railroad tracks, rivers, or canals. Or actually, it's not just mo major roadways. I did any roadway. Um, so you see um, in here, we, we have a range of about 3,600 feet to um, 700,000 feet with that variance with these lines. Um, preserving minority access district. This, um, I list that 
fifth or whatever in among my pillars. But I think that this really goes in tandem as, as the most important item. You have population variance and minority access districts are really the first two that are kind of do not pass go if you don't accomplish these sorts of things. So a minority access district was defined um, by the Voting Rights Act. And the Voting Rights Act is unfortunately really ambiguous as to what is a minority access district and how you, um, and what is sufficient to, to meet that threshold. But basically what they say is that it is a district where a minority group is able to have sub substantive influence on the outcome of an election. So it's not saying that that minority group needs to make up 50% of the electorate or anything like that, but they have to be able to influence the election and basically have a candidate of their choosing. Um, one of the key ways that the courts have interpreted this is that you should not be able to decrease the, the percentage of that district that is a minority group. So to just kind of make this easier for everyone, District 3 is Hillsborough County's minority access district. It is uh, the district that is kind of earmarked as an African-American access seat. Um, right now, the baseline for what you have to hit to have 0% retrogression to maintain the percentage of African-Americans in that district is 39%. So that's what everybody was aiming for, was a 39% African-American population in District 3. Um, the, and you can see that with the first row of, of this table, we all, all three maps come very close or hit 39%. There are two other stats that I provided on this because it really determines whether African-American voters have influence on the, on the outcome of the election or not. Uh, the first stat is the percentage of registered Democrats in their district three that are African-American. And the reason why I included this is Normally, a minority access seat is represented by a Democrat. So say, um, say there was a lower percentage of African Americans in the Democratic primary, they actually will have less impact on the overall election because they're not choosing the candidate who is likely to win. I think in District 3, historically, Democrats win by about 40 points. Um, so it's a pretty substantive margin. So it's often considered that the primary election is the real determinant of who wins. Um, so you see here that all of them come fairly close. There's about a two point margin or a one point margin uh, between uh, maps E and G and map F. Um, and then the second one is actual turnout numbers. Um, so rather than just looking at registration numbers, look at who actually has turned out. So I looked at the 2018 Democratic primary um, and what you see is that margin is a little bit uh, a little bit larger. And that makes sense because what we do see nationwide is that particularly in primary elections, you do tend to have lower turnout levels with African-American voters. John, yes. in reference to this particular criteria, Teria, ah. Michael wants to know why District 1 is, uh, is not considered a minority access for Hispanic population. I'm really glad you asked that. Um, so in addition to having minority access seats for African-American voters, there can be uh, Hispanic minority access seats. There actually um, in some areas are Native American access seats um, and, and you know, a lot of different constituencies that you can think of a lot of different demographics. In Hillsborough County, District 1 right now, which is uh, the district represented by Harry Cohen, it's the one that encompasses South Camp and then wraps around the Bay. Um, it actually has a relatively low Hispanic population. Uh, this is a little bit of a surprise because what you see is that on our school board, a lot of the overlapping territory um, is there and the school board tends to elect a Hispanic representative to their district one, which is kind of like the West Tampa seat. Um, but we don't see the same de demographics carry over to our county commission just because there's four districts here instead of five. The other factor with this is even on our school board, their uh, seat that is that typically elects a Hispanic uh, elected official actually isn't considered a minority access seat either. 
And I really don't have a good reason for you uh, why that's the case. Um, this is really getting at the ambiguities that I mentioned before with the Voting Rights Act. It doesn't really define what a, a minority access seat is well. So it leaves a lot of us guessing. Um, but historically, that seat has not been considered minority access. And, his, and where we are with county commission, it just doesn't come anywhere close enough to, to hit those benchmarks. Um, I believe, and I'll have to follow up on this, but I believe that each one of these maps actually increases the Hispanic population in District 1, though. So Hispanic voters will actually have increased influence on District 1 uh, beyond what they currently do. The last thing to touch on is contiguous. Um, and Noreen talked a little bit about this, but basically all parts of a district have to be connected to all other parts of a district. Um, they, there can't be any disconnect there. Um, and this isn't um, anything that you really measure uh, with breakdown of stats. It's, it's you did it or you didn't do it. And all the maps accomplished that. Um, what I wanted to end with was just kind of a summation of where we are with each of the maps in each one of these categories. Um, and down at the, in the last row of this sets out what the general objective should be. Um, when I set out the objectives, these are obviously ideal world objectives when you're hitting that 0% or hitting a zero or 100% or hitting a zero. Um, so you don't ever expect a map to actually hit this but you wanna see a map as close to that as possible. And um, with that, what I figured I would do is go ahead and just stop talking for a second, especially can I, since I could be monotone and welcome any questions uh, that y'all have. Um, and I think we had discussed, you know, if, if y'all don't wanna type out a full question, I'm, I'm happy for y'all to unmute and, and chime in. There's nothing else in the chat at this point. May I ask a question? This is uh, Peggy Quince. At Please what do. point are we in, in looking at these maps? I know you said these are the three that are being considered, correct? Yes, ma'am. Do they have regular meetings to, to talk about these? And where are we in that process? Yes. Um, and actually, I'm really glad you asked this question. So y'all, some of y'all likely saw some of these maps at some early town hall meetings. What they did was they went ahead and they did town hall meetings, one in each district where they rolled out maps. They also set all of them up online and did kind of a public comment session with them where people uh, could leave remarks and all that stuff. Now, the unfortunate situation that we're in is none of those maps that made their way to town halls and none of those maps that were exposed to public comment are being considered any longer. All of those maps were changed or thrown out. Um, so uh, what happened was uh, Commissioner Kemp revised her map. So she had a, an initial map being considered, but she threw that one out and submitted a revision. Commissioner Myers revised her map, did the same thing throughout her initial map and submitted a revision. And then Commissioner Cohen did not initially submit a map, but he submitted, um, he did one following the public comment session uh, for consideration. Um, where we are now going forward is there are two meetings that are scheduled. There's a meeting on November 8th at 6 p.m. and a meeting at, on November 16th at 6 p.m. Um, these two town hall meetings are set up for exactly that, to get public comment, public input. Um, now, one thing with this is there is very limited capability to change any of these maps as they are right now. It's a little bit ambiguous what sort of change can happen, but our county charter says that you are not allowed to change the districts for any map under consideration, not, it, not allowed to do any significant changes without 30 days of advertising. Um, we also have to complete this process this year. So we're at a point now where basically no significant revisions can happen 
I'm, we don't define what a significant revision is though. Hmm. So uh, I guess you're saying basically is one of these maps is going to end up being the map. Um, not to delve too far into prognostication, but uh, you know, to, to break away from from you know the statistical approach, I would be surprised if there was a deviation from one of these three maps. Yes. So I, I, I'm sorry for all these questions, but so to the extent there are public comments, what the public comment should be is which of these maps you think best follows all of the guidelines set out in the fair districts and the federal law and all of that. If, if one of them is gonna be the map, then we need to be focusing on which one is the best of the three maps. Is that um, a fair? I, I'll go ahead and pass that over to the league to, to give their input on what public comment could be like. Noreen, did you want to answer that question? Because I, I know what my answer is at this point, knowing what I know, which is I think Peggy is, is, is right that there won't be, there's no new maps coming out. This, this is pretty much it, right? That's right. Yeah, and I, the reason we convened this um, meeting as quickly as we could was to enable participants to have a data-driven method for evaluating what the most, what map most represents a fair map. Um, so we are not at this moment endorsing any particular map, we're just saying, um, using the best science that we have, this is how the three maps line up. I'll, I'll say one other thing. You know, I mentioned at the beginning that these six areas are pillars for what you should try and achieve with redistricting. That doesn't mean that, like, that this is how it has to be. If you get a really great map maker, they can make anything happen with this. So, you know, take this into consideration. This is you know, a statistical objective analysis of the maps, but also look at the maps. You can, you can check out the maps um, on the Hillsborough County website. It was dropped in the chat at the beginning of the conversation um, and we can drop it again. Um, you can also just find it by Googling Hillsborough County redistricting. And I think it's the first link that pops up. And there's other things that you can look at. You know, if you are from Apollo Beach, the maps treat Apollo Beach differently. If you're from Brandon, the maps treat Brandon differently. Go in and zoom in to where you are and see if you feel like it is fair for yourself. So I, I really think that these objective analyses are important, but it also is worth looking at the other things and seeing if there's something that sways you. Uh, John? Yeah. Hey. Um, so Correct me if I'm wrong, but on the um, slide where you discuss, uh, talked about the minority access district, you said it was from the 2018 primary. Yes. Um, for District Three, there was it was 2020. You're probably talking about. So I for 2018, I was looking at the gubernatorial primary. So oh, okay. um, it gets a lot more difficult because what you're you don't know which voters vote in which seat. You, you know what the overall turnout is and you can get demographics of the overall turnout. But we of course have voter drop off. So a lot of people will vote in the gubernatorial race but then not vote on the bottom of the ticket races. Um, and actually what you do see is that uh, historically marginalized populations tend to have higher rates of drop off than uh, wealthier, less marginalized populations do. So what you would expect um, in District 3 with African-American voters being a historically marginalized population is that the, the turnout levels would be even more uh, expand, uh, would be lower there. So the divides would be more expansive. Okay. I just wasn't sure if you, because I looked at them, like there was no District 3 commission race in 20, 2018. 
And I'll go ahead and just explain why I did 2018 instead of 2020. And that's just that it was easier for me to get those numbers. 10 to four. So Jean wants to know, how is the final decision on which map is chosen made and who makes that decision? Um, so the county commission will make that decision. My understanding, I'm still awaiting confirmation on this, but my understanding is that it actually will be a single vote. So many of us who watch the county commission are used to a first reading and second reading happening where all the commissioners will, all the commissioners will vote on something and then we'll reconvene a week later or however long later and vote on it again. It seems that that is not going to be the case in this in this situation, that it's not the case with redistricting, that they take a single vote. So that single vote will actually be my understanding, still awaiting confirmation, but my understanding is that it will be for that second town hall meeting, that November 16th meeting at 6 p.m. Mm. And Bruce wants to know, what are the next steps for keeping redistricting in Hillsborough County fair? Um, I, I think that's up to, to y'all as voters. Uh, so I, I guess to, to, to be a little more expansive rather than a throwaway comment, I have not heard of any sort of uh, charter amendment. So rather than being uh, ruled by a constitution, Hillsborough County is, is ruled by a charter in order to readdress how any sort of redistricting happens in Hillsborough County, it would take an amendment to the charter. Actually, the last time this happened was following the 2010 redistricting uh, and Commissioner Smith is the person who, who really drove uh, the charter amendment. And what she drove was an amendment to say that you're not allowed to just sneak in changes at the last minute, that any significant change that you, have, that you make has to be advertised for 30 days. Um, that's actually what is keeping any changes from likely happening from here on out is that there wouldn't be proper advertising for it. Uh, I think that the story was that Ruskin got divided last minute a decade ago, uh, and she, she had some charter changes in response to that. The commissioner is with us, I believe, if she cared to comment. Or maybe maybe I'm mistaken. Hey, I thought she had oh, joined. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, yes. That's correct. Um, and at the time, uh, it it seemed, uh, and I was able to convince the Charter Review Commission to put it on the ballot, and then the voters uh, uh, affirmed it and voted for it because um, it seemed like. Um, the right thing to make sure the right thing was done in terms of uh, not having a last minute drastic change. Um, in that case, a map was pulled out of nowhere, a whole new map and and put out on the dais uh, uh, as the commissioners were voting and um, they all chose that one, um, which you know, the voters woke up in the morning and found in the newspaper uh, that their districts had been drawn in a map that nobody had ever, the, the citizens, a lot of, nobody had ever seen before. Um, it would, it's only uh, coming around to, to cause a time crunch now be, uh, because, which was unforeseen at the time, because the census was so late this year, and this has to be done after the census. So ordinarily our census is done much earlier in the year and you would have time to have another map and have it go back out for 30 days if that's what was required. But in this case, we were pushed up uh, way to the end of the year by the time this process could get started because the census was so late. So now we're up, up against uh, uh, this time crunch. But the nice situation that that set us up for is we won't be surprised by a map. Y'all will be able to weigh in and have your voices heard, uh, provide whatever input you want to about one of these three maps. And, and you're, you're not gonna have a surprise where you're reading the Tampa Bay Times the next day and something was passed that you never knew about. And this has been, you know, um, we're about halfway through the process. So as John had described, 
this has gone out to the community. It has uh, been before the board. It's been in public meetings and we have been receiving public comment. It's just that the window is closing for that now. Mm -hmm. Any Thank other you. questions? Yeah, Michael had Michael wants to know if the league's going to vote on an on an endorsement of a map, or do does the league feel that all three are ready for litigation? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll take that one. Um, up until this point, we have not here in Hillsborough voted um, to endorse or or not endorse any of these maps. However, we discussed at our board meeting last night that after this presentation, we might want to reconsider um, and we will be talking um, together about that in the next week or so. So, all right, happy to answer any other questions, but as they seem to, to have all been asked, I will go ahead and stop sharing and hand it back over. Oh, um, I see a question popped up. Lynn probably saw it too. You want to? Yeah. Um, Jean wants to know if we can clarify which commissioner wrote maps E, F, and G. I will leave that to the yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could check this on the county website uh, where it is prominently displayed, but uh, Commissioner uh, Kemp uh, map is E, Commissioner Myers is F, and uh, G is uh, belongs to Commissioner Cohn. That, okay, that looks like the end of the questions for now. Um, so I'm gonna take back over one moment. So uh, the timelines are short. Um, like we, this just summarizes uh, what the time frame is and the public meetings, <clears throat> um, and reiterates what uh, what John just said about uh, it's the the it's the sixteenth um, will be the time at which um, a map will be chosen, as far as as I know at this moment. Um, so what can you do? Obviously sign up to present at the commission meetings, um, write a letter to the commissioners and the staff, make an appointment to see your commissioner individually or their, or their staff. Um, there's also opportunities to provide um, comments in the online portal. And that uh, link has been put in the chat, I think three or four times, um, but it's like hillsboroughcounty.org forward slash redistricting, I believe. Um, or just Google it as John described. Um, the school board must also redistrict. So um, that meeting is two days from now from 11.30 uh, to 1.30. Um, the Pasco County Commission is voting on their maps on December 7th. Um, and there was some discussion this weekend over um, there may be there were conflicting locations published in this regard. So um, feel free to send an email to us at redistricting uh, at hclwv.org. Okay, that's the part I always mix up, um, but it's on the last slide. So uh, you can uh, copy it down. Um, the city of Tampa has to finish by next June. So there will be more, um, from us on that score um, as that rolls out. Um, are there more questions? I think there are a couple. There's one question from David. He wants to know if his state house boundaries and congressional ones are all different. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll jump on. Um, they are all different. And one of the main reasons why all of your districts are different from one another is because a lot of your districts are drawn by different groups. So your congressional boundaries um, and legislative boundaries are, are drawn by, by the state. The county commission boundaries are drawn by the county commission and the school board are drawn by the school board. And then uh, actually the Tampa City Council, if you live in the city of Tampa, are drawn by, this, by the city. Um, 
so you have that and they happen at different times. So you, you often have a mismatch in those boundaries. Um, I know that I've heard some talk with the school board where they want to aim to mirror the county commission districts as much as possible. At least some of the members were talking about that. That is great because it decreases confusion for voters. It's really difficult to accomplish, however, because there are five districts in the school board and there are four districts for the county commission. So you're not gonna have an exact match there. Um, so unfortunately we are stuck with this system where it is kind of convoluted and confusing. Beatrice wants to know what kind of comments would be helpful at this point, and would we simply urge our commissioners to vote for a specific map based on the factors you presented? I mean, I would I would encourage, uh, I mean, one encourage them broadly to stick to the fair districting principles, but. I mean, we put this information out so that people can make educated decisions about what is the best map um, to guide them. So if you find this compelling um, or you have some other compelling reason um, to endorse one map uh, over another, um, our, our bottom line is to have an active, um, to have an active community and to make sure that the, the seats um, the maps best reflect that. So um, it, it, as far as we're not currently endorsing a map, I would say take this information and please um, sign up, talk to your commissioner. Um, they wanna hear from you. So I would say take it and go forth and do good. And Noreen, could you just summarize again very briefly what's happening at the state level? Sure. Um, the, at the state level, um, the House has an overarching committee, but has two subcommittees, one working on congressional redistricting, one working on the state uh, House and Senate redistricting. The Senate has a single committee, because there's fewer of them, that are doing both of those things. Um, all of those uh, subcommittees and committees have met uh, at least once, I think they've all met twice um, in the committee weeks that have taken place so far. The next um, committee weeks open uh, November 2nd, if I'm not mistaken, is the Monday. And there is a at least one other committee week after that before session opens in January. So um, earlier, the, ear the early couple of meetings were really educating the legislature on the importance of redistricting, where the data come from. Um, the, there's a joint uh, website between the House uh, and Senate where they are taking public comment um, with respect to the congressional state maps. And um, so people can propose maps there. Um, they are going to have to get a sponsor from a legislator in order to move those maps forward. Um, there is no plan at present to have public comment other than um, showing up in Tallahassee and presenting uh, to the committees, but there is still some discussion over how to make that a more um, inclusive process uh, in 2010. They did have town halls across the state um, in the COVID times. That's not really an option, but there are obviously, just like us, Zoom options and other ways that, that the process can be made more transparent and more open, um, which the leadership says they're committed to. So the, we'll, we'll see if there'll be other uh, avenues of participation um, other than driving up to Tallahassee and showing up at the committee. We have a comment from David. He says he's concerned that a chunk of District 2 is taken from Democratic voters and it is therefore, and therefore favors the opposite. Um, John already, already answered that really, really well for oh. me actually. It was okay. just that somebody was asking how, 
do you have a consensus about what concerns we might bring to the county commissioners? And my thought was, what if we each oh, just briefly okay. threw in our thought? Hmm. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. And Bruce really wants the league to take a stand on one of these maps. <laughs> Okay. Well, we won't do it in the next 20 minutes. I can tell you that. Right, not, not today, but we'll talk about it. Be proactive. Is Bruce, Bruce a member? I may not be, um, I, I will join. If just you... asking, that's just Okay. Curious. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> do we have the slide with the, uh, maybe it's time to show the, uh, QR code, if you are interested, um, just get a little advertisement here. Student yeah. members, student, full-time students are free. Uh, regular membership starts at $60 a year. And uh, yeah, we welcome you all. Anyone 16 years and older is eligible to join, as I mentioned. Yeah, we welcome and encourage you. <clears throat> so if you shoot that with your phone, Get right there. That's right. Um, no additional questions. Then uh, here is uh, my contact information. Uh, feel free to email me or um, you could call. Um, <laughs> it seems, seems an unusual, but um, feel free to do that. Uh, we have the list of participants and uh, we will be getting this recording up on our YouTube channel um, pretty quickly, um, you know, given that commission uh, meetings are, you know, 10 days away. Um, we want to get the info out there. Feel free to share it. Um, we'll send some more resources along with that, uh, with that link. So stay tuned, watch your email, and um, thank you ever so much. Um, we really appreciate, um, thank you, John, um, for an amazing uh, presentation. Thanks, Deb and Lynn, for uh, helping me th through this and uh, making a great show of it. And thank you all, uh, all of you participating and, you know, join the league. Um, we, we would just love that. So thank you all um, and have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Good job. Thank you, Noreen. It was awesome. And thank you all for being here.